You're listening to the Lone Star Play Podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. We have a wonderful episode today. A uh, beautiful book that's going to be coming out in August. It's called Taste, a Book of Small Bites, and it really just dives into the idea behind taste. Where did it come from? Where are we headed with it? What does it mean? How do we discover taste? How do we enjoy taste? How is it different from other people? Um, and I found this absolutely fascinating. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but everything that I've read so far is amazing. And I know y'all are going to enjoy this. So we have the author of the book on. She is a professor of creating creative writing at the University of North Texas, uh, which is up in Denton, if you're familiar with that. Uh, she's a poet, author, educator. And when I saw a poet, I was fascinated because we actually had a great poet on one time, Wendy Barker. I will never forget that interview with her, one of the most amazing people I ever spoke to. I'll never forget her. And when I saw um, that our guest was also a poet, man, that brought back some good memories. So this is going to be a good conversation. Um, her name is Jean Dubrow. Um, welcome to the show. So excited to have you and so excited to discuss this book. Did I get the name right? Let's, yeah, let's perfect. see that right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> of course. Yes. Again, we're, we're so excited to talk about your book. Comes out here in August. Uh, actually, the first question I kind of have, um, I think with anybody that's written something or done something creative, like why? Why did you want to do this project? Yeah, so this book came out around in a sort of different way than a lot of my books have. Um, I had written a few years ago a book about my passion for the sense of smell, um, which was called Through Smoke. And it's about basically how I fell in love with the art and science of perfume. Um, and one of the editors for this philosophical seri series at Columbia University Press, which is called No Limits, had read Through Smoke. And so the editors wrote to me and they were like, hey, do you want to do another book on scent? And, and I sort of said, well, you know, I feel like I've written that book. But I'd been thinking about how I wanted to write a book on taste or on food in general. Um, and so I said, well, what about taste? And they liked the idea. And um, so I submitted a proposal, which as a poet I'd never done before. It was an entirely new process for me. Um, and you know, it's really interesting to sort of dream up, dream up a book and say, hey, this is the book I want to write before you've written a word of it. Yeah. Um, wow. But the whole thing sort of came together very easily for me. It, it was the most enjoyable, enjoyable book I've ever written. Um, wow. Yeah, which it just was such a, a pleasure to think about this thing that we sort of take for granted which was the same kind of position that I wrote um, the book about smell from. Smell is this sense that we often forget about. Writers tend not to write about it. It's very hard to write about smell. Um, and taste is in some ways very much the same way. We taste things every day. Most of the time we don't think about the fact that we're tasting things so often, except when we taste something amazing or something really terrible. Yeah. And so it was really fun to try to uh, put a language to this thing that most of the time is so invisible in our lives and yet so connected to memory and to emotion. Um, the way we process uh, taste in the brain um, is through a, a little part of the brain called the amygdala, which is where um, memory and emotion reside. And so when, when we taste something, it immediately is triggering all sorts of powerful receptors in the brain that are giving us um, interesting messages, not just about the present, but also about our pasts. Um, so taste is, is a kind of time machine too. You know, if you taste the right thing, you could be launched into the past, um, back to childhood in many cases. And, wow. you know, there are not that many things in our life that have that kind of power. Absolutely. So, that's so it's fascinating. It's a really fun project to write. Oh, okay. absolutely. That's so fascinating. You know, as a, I guess an ex-chef, I'm not a chef anymore. I don't run a kitchen. It's been a few years now. Um, I always said that smell was how you also tasted things, right? Something in the industry that's talked about, like you smell the food before you taste it. 
You know, um, it's typical. I ran bars for a long time. I'm a first level sommelier. So I also mm -hmm. learned about wine and right, like smell. It's all in the smell. Yeah. It's not even in the taste. I mean, I don't know. That was kind of the theory, right? Um, that it's really the smell was like where you got a lot of the flavors and tastes would give you textures and things. But the truth is, as we more discover, right, there's a lot, it's a lot deeper than we know our understanding of this stuff. I find it just so fascinating. Um, so, okay. So the, the, the book first starts with this great quote, um, you know, well, the book, the, the aperitif, as you call it, uh, the, you know, the intro to, to the book. Um, so I, I tell you what, 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 why don't we give the audience like, I'll use another food term, the amuse-bouche of like this, this uh, what, what the book total sort of will give people? Like, what, what do they get out of this book? Yeah, so um, the book ha begins with an introduction that, uh, that I call the aperitif, and then at the end, there's a conclusion that I call digestif. Yeah. So you, know, you, you get these nice little beverages at the, uh, the start and at the end of the meal. Um, and one of the things that I explain in the introduction is that I love meals of small plates. Um, so for instance, tapas or metza, um, and that sort of created for me a logic of how the book would be structured, that I would divide the book into the five tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, or savory. Um, but that within each of those sections, there'd be these little essays that were like little tiny plates, little bites, um, because I'm not an expert um, I'm a I'm a poet. I'm not an expert in our sense of taste or in food in general, but I wanted to sort of take the reader through my experience of taste. And when I was writing this book, I thought, well, any of us could have our own book on taste and they'd be filled with remarkably different and unique flavors. We're each raised with different um, taste experiences and taste memories. Um, and so I wanted the book to be sort of idiosyncratic and specific to my experiences with my, without it making any claims that my experiences are the only experiences you could have with taste, that, that each of us could, could come up with this kind of book of small bites of our own. So all of the essays are meant to be read on their own, but also you could read the book straight through as well, or you could sort of pick and choose, like maybe one, one day you're in the mood for something sweet, and so you read the essay on honey. Um, maybe on another day you're interested in thinking about salty things, so you read the essay about tears. Um, and the book can be read both, in other words, in a kind of linear way or in this discrete way, like you're picking and choosing um, what you're in the mood for, what, what you're hungry for that day. So that that's sort of that sort of was my concept in thinking about the book. Um, and it was really, for me, helpful in writing it because I, I didn't have to then work in a linear way as I was writing the book. I could say, oh, today I want to write about um, gingerbread or today I want to write about um, pomegranates uh, and and see what, what happened and where my research took me. Yeah, amazing. That's amazing. That's a great uh, way to do that. It's almost like, it's a little bit like a poetry book, right? In a sense, right? It's like you can, I, I, honestly, that's a great way to present something that you want people to learn about because you're also an educator. So you think about that too. At yeah. least that's in my mind, right? Like that's cool. Um, you know, it's funny, I used to live in uh, Spain. Um, my wife is from Spain and we, uh, specific, I lived all over, but I used to live in Granada uh, for a while. And that's where tapas, you know, originated in Spain, in Andalusia, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the practice still exists that you go, you buy a drink and you get a little plate of food to accompany your drink and it's included quote unquote in the price and you learn in Granada which places to go they give the best tapas you know it's kind of how it works and they level up so I, I worked in the industry there as well so you know I worked at restaurants there and you know you level up right so the longer you stay at a certain place by the sixth drink or fifth drink I know that sounds like a lot but in Spain it's not uh <laughs> they're they're a little lighter to be honest and you know you're getting like caviar and you know the best stuff but at the beginning it's like a little piece of bread and and tortilla española right like nothing just something to uh, excuse me just something to wet the palate but 
a small play. And the idea to eat like that there is very universal, really all over Spain, to share these dishes and experiences and flavors and taste with, with everybody. And you take about, dude, you got to try this. Oh, get, get a little bite of this. And sharing that experience of taste and flavor, because like you said, we all have a unique journey with taste and flavor. And I find that also fascinating, right? How many billions of people on the planet all experiencing this unique journey uh, with that? I, I find that fascinating. Um, what, uh, ha have you ever been to Spain eating tapas like that? Have you ever done that? Or are you all only here, like in the States? I, I was first introduced to tapas. I'm, I grew up all over the world, but I spent many years living in Washington, DC. And, um, the great Spani Spanish chef, Jose Andres, um, yeah. who's known for his wonderful organization, World Kitchen, started yeah. in DC. Yeah. Um, and so I remember the first time- Zendaya, Zendaya, yeah. Zendaya right? Zatinia, yeah, which is Zatinia. an amazing- Zatinia, Zatinia, that's Zendaya. What am I saying, that's an actress. <laughs> oh and he has an amazing Mexican um, restaurant called Oyamel uh, downtown yeah. that does sort of a Mexican take on tapas. Um, and so I remember like, going to one of his restaurants, Haleo, um, and just falling in love um, with with the with all these tiny little plates and everybody trying something. In my family, we're not very good at sharing. Um, <laughs> we all want our own plates, but sure. you know, in in a place like that, you can't resist taking off of somebody else's plate. Um, so inevitably there'd be, you know, like a dozen little plates at the table and, you know, somebody would have ordered, uh, my father would always get like the, the calamari cooked in its own, um, ink, yeah. uh, by the end of the meal, his teeth would be sort of a purplish black, sure. uh, you know, and somebody would always get the patatas bravas and, you know, the there would just be this incredible, wonderful mix of, of foods at the table. And it's the best way to to try a lot of flavors. Yes. Um, and it's so communal, of course, too. Uh, so it brings people together, right? Like it's um, breaking bread, right? That was the whole idea behind this podcast when we first started, um, was the idea that food brings people together um, from different backgrounds, uh, right, culture, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, Anytime I've traveled, food has been the way to break the ice and to sit down and get to know somebody. Um, and the flavor that you experience and the taste, that go, it's all part of it. I, I, feel, I find that all fascinating. Um, okay, so um, let's, let's jump into, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, this story that you tell a little bit um, in the beginning of the book. It's in the aperitif, but I just found it so fascinating. We, we have to bring it up. Um, you tell the story about how you were dating a guy and you, well, I mean, you didn't tell the story about dating the guy, but that you had broken up with them because he liked, he preferred vanilla ice cream over chocolate and you'd written unforgivable. You know, I found that so funny. Um, <laughs> I found it so funny. Let, let's, um, but you also talk about the experience of learning from that um, as well. So like, I, I find that fascinating right because we at one point we want to say you right because you also say no one gets to tell you what to like right no. so right the idea that i mean it's just like anything right music move it the art like it's it's subjective but you make an argument that there are objective parts to it right we can both agree this is salty or we can both but i'll be honest as a chef that is not objective. That is subjective too, because I've had somebody come up and write, taste something and go, this is, whoa, too much salt. And someone go, needs more. You're like, okay, what do we do, right? Where, where do we go with that? Uh, because we destroy our taste buds mm -hmm. through life. So they get affected or maybe genetically, you just, they're not the same. I don't know, right? I guess this is a journey to, to go down the ages. So yeah, what, what made you include that story? And, and yeah, has that, opinion chain or yeah let's just dive into that i guess yeah i think um you know right away even though i start with talking about taste in a literal way like the things that we we eat and how we perceive them um we all know that almost immediately in our lives when we're talking about taste we'll shift from talking about foods and flavors to 
the other sorts of tastes that we develop, like taste in music or um, taste uh, in movies. Um, and so there's this really slippery line between that literal notion of taste and, and how quickly it veers into metaphor and how very much we assess other people based on whether we respect or appreciate or agree with their tastes. And for me, the chocolate vanilla division was like, insurmountable when it came to a romantic relationship because it really spoke to like this idea well if we could agree on something that is so fundamental like like disliking chocolates um maybe the food in my family that we are all the most passionate about um then I knew that people are always so mysterious to us, especially in, in romantic relationships. There's always a sense like this person it's in some way will always remain partially hidden to me. But right at the beginning to learn that he didn't like chocolate, um, for me, like was a big flashing red sign like, okay, as much as I like this person, they're probably other hidden things about him that are going to be real deal deal breakers. Um, and I would never have tried to persuade him. I mean, how can you persuade somebody who doesn't like chocolate to like it? Um, I do think we can sometimes persuade ourselves to change our tastes. Um, one essay that I wanted to write for the book, but that didn't end up there is how I taught myself to like black licorice. One morning I woke up um, this was, I think, in the like at the height of the pandemic when we're all in our houses, and I think I was just craving something new. And I woke up and I thought, I'm going to teach myself how to like black licorice, even though it was a flavor that repulsed me. Um, and over the next few months, I did teach myself to do that. So I think we can change our own tastes, but I think it's... Um, probably unwise to try to persuade other people that they're wrong about their taste, if only because it's sort of disrespectful. Um, sure. the, uh, the other reason why I broke up with this guy, and this is also food related, is that we went to a restaurant one time together and he spent 45 minutes looking at the menu and couldn't figure out what he ordered. And for me, that was also like a lethal crime, that lack of, that inability to make a decision um, also I have, I tend to be one of those people who, when my blood sugar plummets, I turn into a monster and I thought I can't be with this person for the rest of my life, starving at a table, <laughs> becoming, like, diabolical in my hunger while he's still figuring out what drink to order. So <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a, there were two parts to that story about why I realized, oh, this, this very nice person is really wrong for me. Sure. Uh, that's a what a great story. Uh, I get that. I, honestly, a lot of people listening or watching are going to relate to that. I think <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say 100% of people are like I've been there at one point. You've just had that thing, you know. But I will say this, just to whatever, throw it out there. In my experience as food, I have a lot of experience in food and people eating food and tasting food and and watching them taste it and ask them about the experience of it. Like a a lot of experience in that. I would say this. You can get people to try other things they say they don't like and get them to like it. It's, it's, uh, it's about a journey. It's like educating someone on a topic they don't understand and they deny it at first or hate it at first because they don't understand it. It's the same thing with food. I don't want to try that. I don't like sushi. I don't like this. Give me a second. Maybe you haven't had it prepared in a way that you will take it, right? And then I can take you on a journey for other preparations that open it up even further, right? And, and you know, training wheels at first. So, yo, you don't like chocolate? Let me try a little bit of this. It's got a little chocolate something on the side. It's a, it's a side player, you know, <laughs> right? It's a side character. It's not the main part of the story. And, okay, I can deal with that. It adds to this, right? Maybe a mole with a little bit of chocolate, or maybe a chili with a little bit of chocolate added, right? It's something they wouldn't notice, but oh, wow, that chocolate does add this interesting flavor. So now let me, again, break it out. But again, this is a whole nother thing, right? Like, that's why I love this stuff. Um, but I'm with you on like trying to force people or whatever, like that's their thing. No problem. I, I actually could totally, you know, would make the, you know, people make those sort of conclusions 
in our day-to-day -day life like that, right? Like if, if somebody's like can't make a decision on this menu for 45 minutes, they probably have tough times making decisions, period, in life, right? About a lot of things. Um, it's a perfect example of that. Um, you know, I always would say like I can tell a lot by somebody how they treat wait staff and bus busers and hostesses and right bartenders and that I, it works. I mean, it's true. I can tell a lot about you by how you treat them. It's just that simple. Um, and it has proven to be true to me. So like, I get it like a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, that's so fascinating to me. I gotta say. Sometimes it's those little signs that, that yeah. can tell you quite a lot about. Yes. A person. Well, we ignore them a lot of the times. Yeah. We yeah. ignore them because we think they're small and insignificant, but like the saying goes, I mean, I think it's still a saying, right? The devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's kind of true, you know, in that sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, the this final flavor, umami. Mm. The, the, this particular term in the food industry, tiene, uh, I'll say, it tiene fama, right? It's got this like um, aura around it, this word. Uh, I would say most people don't know how to use it correctly, what it means. A lot of people think it's an ingredient, like some, like a fizz, like an egg or something on something, or like they think it's yeah. this thing, um, or a piece of fish. I've, you know, I, I don't know. It's just like it's it's gotten thrown around in what it means. Um, but reading what you've learned about it yourself, I'm hoping you can just sort of tell our audience and us, right? Like, first of all, it was discovered in 1908 in Japan. Maybe we can start there and just your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think when I started working on this book, I was as confused um, about umami as as any lay person. Sure. Um, and so I had to do a lot of reading, and um, I think that I'm not very smart when it comes to science. And so one of the harder <laughs> parts was explaining some of the scientific elements of taste. You know, for instance, um, I was reading this wonderful book by a food writer named Nick Sharma, um, who's explaining how how we taste tastes. And I must have read his explanation of the way the taste receptors in the tongue receive tastes and then direct them to the brain 30 or 40 times before I finally thought, okay, I think I'm starting to understand this because I needed to understand it in order to then put it into very simple, accessible terms. So my understanding of umami is, of course, it's always existed. They're essentially, umami is essentially glutamates, salts, uh, particular kinds of salts um, that are in certain foods, some foods heavily and some foods only in tiny proportions. And um, this Japanese scientist essentially like, identified them and recognized their capacity for um, sort of making food taste weightier, more delicious in the mouth. And it's how we get... Um, get something like um, MSG, which is essentially like a, uh, the, the glutamates identified and then put into a perfect form that then helps to magnify flavors. Um, you know, there are foods that we eat all the time, like tomatoes um, or many, um, many different kinds of seafood or um, shellfish or mushrooms. Um, or one of the ones that I learned that entertained me that has um, a lot of umame in it is breast milk. Um, so these these foods, oh, wow. mean these glutamates, and I suspect one of the reasons why they were identified by a Japanese scientist is that um, dashi, which is like a, um, the the sort of like one of the building blocks of much of Japanese cuisine um, uh, is filled with umami. Um, and um, it's why it's sort of a more intuitive concept, I think, if you if you grew up with Japanese cuisine or were raised in Japan. I suspect that all cuisines around the world have their uses of umami coming from different foods. Like in Italian food, the combination of tomatoes and Parmesan is a perfect example. Or in say um, Mediterranean 
cuisines like Greek cooking, the use of things like anchovies and olives. But in Japan, there's this, because dashi is so fundamental to so much of Japanese cuisine, there's a sort of more um, essential understanding of this flavor. And I think the rest of us are sort of playing catch up. I mean, I, I think I probably heard the term umami maybe 10 years ago. Um, and thought, what is that? Um, and it's essentially a, uh, a loan word that means deliciousness, um, tasty, um, which in itself is, doesn't feel helpful like the way when we say something <laughs> sour or yeah. bitter. Sure. Um, because we have- It sounds too broad. Yeah. But it, what it does, it, it adds a fullness on the tongue. It adds a richness on the tongue. Um, sometimes we'll say savory as a, as a synonym for umami, but that's not quite right either because when Correct. I hear the word savory, I think of salts. And Correct. umami doesn't necessarily have to be a salty experience. Sure. Uh, even though glutamates are a kind of salt. Um, so... Sure. You know, it's such well, salt a, is used in like baking, right? You use salt and sweets. So right. It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it and salt magnifies flavors and Correct. you need salt to often bring out other flavors. Like you said, like sweetness. Absolutely. Yes. yes salt so, is, and there's many types of salt. You got finishing salts, you got cooking salts, you got table salts, iodized salts. I, I could go down the line what they do with salts. I used to scrape fresh salt off of rocks in the Mediterranean and boil it and, uh, you know, strain it and then use it on food. Like, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of salts and it is to enhance flavors. The first thing you learn as a chef with salt is, honestly, you don't add it till the end because foods have the umami or the salts, some of them that you're using already. So you just at the very end need it to bring it out, like you're saying. When I was thinking about what you were saying earlier about like the reasons why our tastes and our taste buds change, um, my mom, um, for instance, had breast cancer and her chemo treatments really messed with her sense of taste. Um, oh, wow. And she was always one of those people who put too much salt on her food. Yeah. Um, and now, because her taste buds are so unpredictable, you never know from meal to meal whether she's going to dump salt on her food or say, oh, this is this is too salty, while the rest of us are thinking, you know, what are you it's talking fun. about? Yeah, yeah, totally. So wow. it, it really wow. is an, a moving target, you know, um, to understand taste and how each of us experiences it. But I love the idea that the, the rest of us, if you're outside of Japan and you haven't been raised with, with a flavor like dashi, which is so instantly recognizable as this very particular kind of stock, essentially. Yes. Yep, um, exactly. You know, the rest of us are sort of learning to identify, oh, that's th that quality in the thing I've just eaten is, is umami. You know, and probably so many of us now have in our kitchen, like some kind of dried porcini powder um, sure. that we use to like add that element of umami to dishes that we might not previously have done because of the way um, I think more and more people are becoming educated about this particular taste. Absolutely. Or fish sauce too. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different things that people, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, honestly, I'm excited for people to get behind this and learn and push and maybe we'll learn another new flavor or taste, right? Like that seems likely too, um, which is awesome, which is so cool. Um, yeah, God, this is so fascinating. I gotta say, I I'm just a loving this whole conversation. Um, all right, we're going to move on to this next part. I got to ask you about, um, Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's talk about this. This will be cool. Um, so you, yes, you, you, you make this, these two sentences. Um, let me read them and then we'll, I'll, I'll ask my question here. So you say no, no one else can tell us what we like, period. We must learn our tastes for ourselves, period. Now I know I'm a weirdo. I don't, I just thought that was interesting that you didn't put a comma there and connect those two. You separated the, them as if to say you can understand one without the other. Uh, if I was writing that, I would have put a comma so that I made sure that that, that end connects to the first part. 
Am I overthinking this? You didn't think any of that? Am I stupid no, here? No, I mean, I, again, I'm a poet. So um, I spend the morning putting in a comma and the afternoon taking it out, right? <laughs> so probably, I bet, like, when I look at those two sentences, I bet a different version had a semicolon between them to, to Yes, a semicolon, yeah, yeah. But, you know, because of the way I was taught to write as a poet, I'm always thinking about the rhythm of sentences. So there's a wonderful poet named Ellen Bryant Voigt who wrote a book about writing poetry called The Flexible Lyric. And I remember hearing her speak one time about just the way we use sentences in poetry. And she said something sort of offhandedly, but it stuck, which was that every sentence you write should either be four words longer or four words shorter than the previous sentence. In other words, it's not just that we're thinking when we're writing about like the rhythm of the sentence as a whole, but we're also thinking about the way sentences next to each other create rhythm. So when I'm writing, and this is easy for a short poem, harder for a whole book of prose, I read everything I'm writing out, out to myself over and over and over again. Wow. So I think um, like it's hard for me to take myself back to that place to remember why I put those as two separate sentences. But I bet it was that I wanted that kind of certainty and decisiveness, especially because I was about to launch into the story Correct. Of a guy who I broke up with. Yes. Uh, and so yeah. I sort of was trying to think of like how to set up the drama of we, we reach these decisions about what we feel about all the things in the world, whether the things we can actually taste or things about which we can have a taste. Um, and over time, we become pretty certain about those things. Um, like you were saying, it's wonderful when we can change our own minds or when somebody else can change our minds for us. Um, but you know, a lot of like finding your way in the world is learning what you do and don't like or what you do and don't care about. Um, I think I'm one of those people who's very decisive. So I was lucky early on. I think by second grade, I knew, for instance, I didn't like math, um, but I did like art or I didn't like science, but I did love theater. Um, and, you know, I think uh, so much of this book is at least about conveying like, here's what my certainties are and here are the places where I'm less sure or less confident. You know, like you were saying, part of the job of this book is to, to teach. Um, the No Limits series published through Columbia University Press is a, a series of philosophical meditations, but it's intended not to be for other philosophers. It's intended to be uh, for lay readers. Yeah. So part of my job was to figure out, first of all, I'm not a philosopher. So how do I access these complex ideas in a way that makes sense to me? And then how do I explain them to somebody else? Which is why so much of the book is about images and stories and trying to bring these abstract concepts into our physical bodies. Absolutely. Because it could be really easy when talking about taste to get very airy and sort of up in the ether. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yes. Where is this thing that's happening in our bodies? And I think like you said earlier, taste isn't just a matter of our mouths. It's something that we many of us take in with our eyes. Yeah, uh, you eat. You uh, we always say that uh, you eat first with your eyes when you see the dish, which is why yeah. we want to plate it appropriately, right? Because yeah. if I plate it like it, it doesn't look appealing to want to put in your mouth yes. to have the experience. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm so, sorry, you know, I'm interrupt. Oh no, not at all. So we take it in with our eyes, but we also, of course, smell it, which is you know the sense that I love. Um, there's a texture. We talk about mouth feel of food. Yeah, um, yeah. It's funny because as a poet, I talk about the mouthfeel of language all the time. I want a poem that I write or a sentence that I write to be delicious to say. Um, wow, that is the coolest thing I've ever heard a writer <laughs> say. I got to that is so cool. Wow, I love that. I've never heard that before. That is that is cool. I love so, that. You know, these things are are physical and they're they uh, 
call to all of our senses and we care about them because they bring us back to our own bodies. And we spend so much of our life, I think, trying to get away from our own body, especially if you've ever experienced trauma. Um, you know, you're constantly trying to escape yourself. And the thing about a delicious bite of food is it brings you back to yourself in a way that maybe nothing else can. Um, I, I was watching the other night, there's a new um, Iron Chef. Yeah, um, on Netflix, right? Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, and um, there was one scene where one of the judges had tasted a dessert and he burst into tears because it took him back to his childhood in like a very moving and powerful way. Um, and it was deeply moving to see him crying, you know, because I think we all understand you taste the right thing and it takes you somewhere that you didn't expect to go. A hundred percent. Um, I've been there. I've, I've had that experience. I've, I've cried just from the joy of how good something tastes that I know a chef put all this work and effort and technique and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and bam, here, here is this thing, right? Um, Another thing um, I find fascinating too about food, like with that, right, the memory is like, you know how people are always like, my mom's cooking is the best, right? Like, <laughs> even though it may not be, right? But just for some reason, you're like, when I eat my favorite dish on the planet is just a plate of my mom's, uh, my mom's Mexican, uh, arroz, frijoles, y quesadillas. <laughs> Boom, that's it. And it's nothing special, but it's lit for some reason, the way she makes it, that specific flavor profile that it has is so connected and ingrained in me genetically, I feel at this point in my DNA, that the joy I get from eating it is, is not, there's nothing to compare it to. But it's not any special plate of food. If someone else were to eat it, they're not gonna have that same experience, right? And we all make these connections uh, with the food because again, I I'm, I'm always go back to food as just, and breaking bread with people and eating with people is such, to me, a cornerstone of society um, and keeping us together and hopefully coming together over difficult topics and conversations and um, learning from each other. Culture is built around food a lot. Every time I travel, food is like the one thing I get into to learn about their culture because there's so many stories about this dish or this ingredient or this or whatever it may be. Um, and it's just so fascinating, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it's almost a cliche to say this, but I think for so many people, food is, is an expression of love. Um, absolutely. You know, and um, if you were raised in a household where food was important, um, the, way, the way I was, and it sounds like the way you were, yeah. um, you associate certain dishes with, they're like a representation of love. Um, yes. My mom um, grew up in Honduras. And so, you know, one of the dishes that she would also, always make is arroz con pollo. Um, oh, yeah. and, from, and I know it wasn't particularly special, her, her, her making of that dish, but I associate it with, with um, celebra celebrations because it was often the dish that I asked for, like on my birthday. Sure, absolutely. Um, my father would make a, a chocolate cake that he had inherited the recipe from his his mother, a zahar torta, um, which is a, a, a Viennese dessert. It's a very chocolatey chocolate cake with layers of apricot jam and then like a, a shiny ganache on top. Oh, and I remember great. when my grandmother died, she'd left so like the handwritten recipe, which I still have, of this zahar torta, but she had not included the recipe for the ganache because she made it like just throwing together those yeah. ingredients. So for like the first 10 years after her death, every time my father made a zahar torta, he would try to find a different recipe for ganache to try to get the one that felt the closest. You know, it was like this treasure hunt. Um, and then <laughs> he found one that had the exact right taste and texture but it must have taken a decade of searching. Wow. And the, wow. the rest of us, all the versions tasted great, but he knew, no, this one's not quite right. It doesn't have the right thickness or it doesn't have the right ratio of chocolate or it's not shiny enough. Or, you know, he had this um, 
a philosophy professor would say he had a platonic notion in his mind of what this ganache should taste like. Yes, yes. yes. Until he found it, he wasn't satisfied. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. Um, the, the last part I want to get into before we finish off, I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time, but um, I kind of want to save this for the end because this is something I, I found. I, yeah, I'm not trying to compare, but I, I just found this very fascinating about the book. Um, this idea that um, our journey for, let me see if I can quote you better on it than, than what I'm going to say. Um, oh, what did you put? Uh, oh, yes. Okay, so. Um, in the process of seeking out pleasurable taste, human beings created new tools, methods, and cr- cultural practices. Uh, that this idea that you know early on in human evolution, as our search for food, you know we're looking for more flavorful things, r- nutrient rich, uh, avoiding bitter, right? Something that's going to affect us, and and in that you start to innovate. Um, and grow and our societies grow. Now you start mixing, oh, what are they eating? Oh, let, let's, 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 let's trade, right? This, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. I find that fascinating, right? Our search for good food uh, potentially brought us uh, to where we are. Um, and even, I guess it'll be up for debate forever, but why was it for survival that we did it or another reason, right? I don't know. Yeah, so obviously, again, this is not my area of expertise. Yeah, yeah, we're just... I had read this amazing book called Delicious. Um, I think it's Delicious, the Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human. And it was written by a scientist and an anthropologist. Um, And they essentially take some elements that I think are familiar to most of us. For instance, that when we taste bitter things, the reason why we are made to taste bitter things is to protect ourselves because many poisonous things can can have a bitter quality to them. Correct. Um, Or the reason why uh, salts might be appealing to us is because our body needs salt. Um, Or the reason why sweet things might um, serve us is they provide valuable sources of energy. Um, And so the argument that's made in Delicious is that essentially um, there's an evolutionary reason for why why we notice these tastes and how they serve our bodies. Um, And then over time, as we are evolving as human creatures, um, we're inventing things, inventing cultures, inventing tools to help us find those delicious things. Um, Because the delicious, it turns out, isn't just a matter of pleasure, it's a matter of survival. Yes. And that was really... Uh, um, exciting to think about um, because, you know, most of us, I think, are fortunate enough to think about foods in terms of um, enjoyment. Um, But the fact is that um, ultimately we eat because we have to. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. You know, and, and maybe one of the great joys of being human is that um, we get to eat not only because we have to, but because it brings us joy um, and it nurtures us and it allows us to tell stories and, like you said, gather um, and share parts of ourselves with one another. Um, but at its heart, you know, um, these, these flavors um, speak to different dietary needs in the body. Um, and so when I, when I read that book, Delicious, which I highly recommend, um, yeah, we'll put a link in the uh, description for sure. Even though it's written by scientists, I found it accessible. Again, I'm not super smart when it comes to science, but this was a book that made a lot of sense to me um, and that I could parse easily. Um, you know, that all those rituals that we are accustomed to partaking of at the table um, originally began with the need for human beings to gather food that would sustain them rather than kill them. Yes, that's right. Yeah, exactly. That simple, right? Like literally that simple. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I I think it's funny how they found foods that worked and didn't, right? I remember this comedian telling this joke like, well, don't eat those berries. Uh, That killed Chad. 
Um, you know, don't eat these. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, died from those, um, right? Like you just had to test it back in the day. There was, right? I mean, how the journey to go on that. And also something I learned sort of recently, you might find this fascinating, is how much vegetables, fruits, things have changed, evolved over it. They did not look what they <laughs> look like now. A watermelon yeah. used to be this big. Wow. It has grown into this, right? Pumpkins, everything you know as a vet, tomatoes, you name the vegetable, take it 100 to 2, 3, 4, 100, 500 years it did not look like that. It evolved over time. And then I think, well, what was it like 100,000 years ago? You're walking around just just these natural, how do you know what to, I mean, it, this must have been insane uh, journey of food that we went on. And I think it does have a huge impact on where we are and why we're at the level we're at. I, I really- yeah. I, you know, there's a, uh, near the end of the book in the umami section, I talk about mushrooms. And um, for part of my childhood, we lived in Poland um, and Eastern Europe has a very big mushroom picking culture. Um, and my father went outside of Warsaw into the sort of foresty area with a, with a Polish friend who had probably been picking mushrooms his entire life. And my father said, you know, it was really sort of amazing just to walk with this guy through the woods on a beautiful day and watch him sort of say, yes, no, yes, yes, no, don't touch that one. You know, very matter of factly, so that there was no threat of danger. Sure. Uh, but I mean, I would never go into the forest and, and pick some random mushroom. I would have no idea. What Absolutely mushroom. not. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with mushrooms, right? Uh, oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You really have to know what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. You know, and a delicious mushroom is delicious. I mean, um, oh, yeah. but, you know, it's scary to think like some of these things can really kill you. So you know, my father has this wonderful, blissful memory because he was walking with somebody who was so knowledgeable. Um, and so all that threat was removed from the scene. He just got to enjoy like watching this guy's expertise. Um, but it could it could have been an entirely different story if you weren't walking with somebody who really knew what they were doing. Absolutely. Right. You see those like uh, survival shows um, being out in the woods. Right. And the guy's like telling you like, uh, you know, you can eat this or don't eat this or don't play around with this and don't do that. And they say it, like you said, so matter of factly, because, well, they've either learned the hard way or heard the stories, right? Um, whatever, maybe, or through books and science and learning. And what, what, I mean, I'm sure that's all, a lot of that's been cataloged. Um, yes, the idea that we now can control food, you can call it, it's brought to your door, right? We've come a long way from searching caves and looking under trees for for mushrooms and you know killing animals to get our sustenance which is honestly maybe a reason uh, this is just coming to me now maybe that's a reason why early humans decided to start killing animals right because you know that's not poisonous but maybe this berry is right so I, <laughs> if i kill the ant right that this meat is going to be good so i don't know i mean i just literally just thought of that right now i don't know maybe they're like well let's this is what we know but i guess maybe even back then you wouldn't know if that were, I don't know, this is, it's, it goes forever, right? Uh, essentially, we'll never know the spark, right? With the first human who said, wait, I want better flavors. <laughs> like, was yes. there this, was there this one caveman who was just eating meat with everybody? And he was just like, you know what? He threw a little dirt on it. and was like, oh, it's got a little extra flavors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, right? And it just changed from there. Or the guy who accidentally tripped and, and the carcass fell on the fire and it cooked it a little bit. Like, wait, this is different. Uh, you know, was it an accident? Did they mean to do it? Uh, I, I, I love thinking about all that stuff. Uh, well, and especially when you think about, like, there's, a, there's an essay in the book about chocolate. Um, and when you think about how long chocolate has been around for, but the kind of technology ancient technology that's required to process it is really complex. You know, the fermentation yeah. um, and right. and the different like separations of the, the, the cow pod. Um, this is ancient but complex technology and who figured that out? Uh, you know, what would happen with, you know, the drying of the cacao and and the aging of it and the way heat um, would would 
treated and the separation of the fat. Um, I mean, these are really complicated things. It's it almost seems like magic to me. Absolutely, I totally agree. I hundred percent. It's like bread, right? How would they know to ground down the wheat and then do this and that? Right? I mean, it's like. Yes, I'm with you 100%. Um, I, that's why I think a lot of like stews and porridges and like these soups were big and have always been big because it was this idea of, right, liquid, let's just throw all the different stuff in and cook it um, uh, together. Um, yeah, yeah, every culture has a stew, you know? It yeah. seems like every culture has a stew and then every culture has some kind of dumpling, my very favorite food. Um, and it's yeah, like, right. or an empanada understand. of some sort. Yes. Yeah. Everybody understands you need a filling and then you need to wrap that filling and you've created the perfect food item. Correct. Um, and it's, it's about so delivery system. That's what we talk yes. about. A delivery <laughs> system, right? You've got a tortilla or a piece of bread or that, right? Everyone needs a particular delivery system. So yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah whether it's awesome. an empanada or a samosa or, yeah. Um, you know, uh, some kind of incredible soup dumpling. Yeah, um, yeah right. it's, it's that perfect way of um, combining flavors and nutritional elements. And then, like you said, it's the perfect delivery system because it's easy to hold and easy to carry. That's so. why I love tacos so much. They are the perfect delivery system, uh, you know. Uh, oh, for, for right? sure. I mean, I've only been in <laughs> Texas for, this is my seventh year. But when I came here, I said, you know, the sort of I'd accepted the taco as like, um, well, frankly, my personal savior. Um, but <laughs> yes. That it's it's such an ideal food, um, you know, and you can have many or you can have a few depending on your level of hunger. And there's an infinite number of fillings. And, um, you know, who, who doesn't love a taco? I have, if I meet someone and they don't love tacos, they're not my friend. Uh, I'm like, I'm like you with the guy with the chocolate ice cream, right? Like <laughs> you don't like tacos. What, what am I doing here? What am yeah. I wasting my life with? Uh, yes. Uh, again, like you said, it could be anything. So to say you don't like tacos, wouldn't make sense to me in my mind. You're like, what do you mean? You don't like tacos. It's just, it's like saying you don't <laughs> like air. I don't know what you mean. Like, I, I don't get it. Like you can put anything you want in it. What do you like? Put it in a taco, eat it. You, there you go. There's nothing That's to right. not like about a taco. Yeah, problem solved. There's nothing to not like about a taco. I, I, uh, you don't like eating with your hands? Uh, okay, maybe that could be it. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, food, how we interact with it, taste, how we interact with it. Um, it's just all so fascinating. And I find, you know, your book is really just a great entry point to it it really explains a lot of different things like you said you can jump around with this non-linear you learn a lot again even somebody who has as much experience with food i also learn something from it um so i think this book is great for chefs cooks anyone in the food industry anyone serving bartending right anyone working with food this book is really good for you to be honest with you. this will help you sell more to be honest with you if i was a restaurant i'd be like read this book Let's have a sales meeting on Monday because that's what they call servers now, the salespeople. They also wow. try to get people to enjoy foods they say they don't like, right? That's the job of a server. Oh, you don't like this? Maybe you haven't had it prepared the right way. Let's, let's sell it this way. So, yeah, your book really, it really is amazing. And all these conversations, it opens up. And it's like it's not over. You know, the journey's not over. So I look forward to the sequel. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, taste but taste thank two, the new flavor. Maybe you discover a new flavor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was actually one of my worries when I was working on the book, because there's a lot of literature out there about how there is this question of, is there another taste out there waiting to be recognized? And I, I thought, oh, is. no, I hope they don't recognize it while I'm working on this book. <laughs> that's okay i think that would give you a reason to write another book I, this is i mean this is sort of a joke but i think chefs would say the the other flavor that's missing the sixth flavor would just be shit this just tastes like shit like <laughs> that's, what, that's what we joke about that that's it that's our sixth one when you taste uh, something really awful and you just yeah. know never want to taste it again this is shit that's what we say <laughs> in the 
that that's how you you know you don't mince words with chefs when a chef comes up and says taste this for me they're not looking for you to go oh you're wonderful and did they want the real truth because why they're taking your feedback right and then gonna serve this to the public so we really are that crass in the kitchen now nope, tastes like shit dude something or you know needs a little this needs a little that but we're not afraid to say that so to us the chefs like shit is a flavor profile i hate to say that not that's amazing no i love that idea because ultimately what it comes down to is do you like this enough to to pay for it and eat it correct exactly and that's a big thing that's a responsibility i make sure that i always taught in my kitchens as well is that responsibility hey these people are paying for this food this is different Right? They're paying for the food. It's not the same, right? It's just that someone comes over your house and you present a meal to them. They're deciding to come to your business and pay for that food. So you have to have a respect for the food you're putting on that plate more so than you would a dish that you're giving away or whatever. Even if you're giving away anything I put on a plate in hand to somebody, I've taken all the thought, precaution, right? It matters to me. I respect that dish and I'm handing it to you. Um, and I think as a consumer, we recognize those things. We recognize food like that that's presented uh, to us that way and we enjoy it more. If we feel that a lot of thought and innovation and technique and uh, research or whatever you want to put has gone into this trial and error, right? A sauce that's been prepared for 10 years. Oh, they're using... Uh, um, uh, a sourdough uh, starter from a hundred years ago, right? Like to make this stuff. Oh, okay, cool, right? Like it makes it more enjoyable. Um, so yeah, I find that fascinating too. Anyway, th this has just been the greatest conversation I gotta say. Like, Thank I've you so much, Patrick. I've, lo I've loved this so much. This was so much fun. Um, I can't wait for people to get the book. It comes out um, in August. Uh, I tell you what, let everyone know just how they can stay in contact with you. Uh, we'll obviously put links for the book um, yeah, and we'll stay with it when it comes out in August too and uh, whatnot. But yeah, just how people can stay in contact with you. And if you have any future things that are in the works or sure. something you want to mention. So I, you know, I'm always posting stuff on my website, which is just my, my name, Sean Dubrow. And um, you can follow me on Twitter. Although on Twitter, I mostly post pictures of my three Bedlington Terriers. Um, so not <laughs> always the deepest, most meaningful content. Um, I'm working on a, a couple of books right now. I'm working on a new collection of poetry. Um, called Civilians, which is about um, my husband is retired military, so I'm writing about what happens to a military marriage once once one of those people is no longer actively serving. Um, and I'm writing a book um, called Red Monsters, um, which is about my long-term love affair with a um, a writer named, not literally a love affair, but a love affair with the work of um, a Canadian writer named Anne Carson, and specifically a book she call, wrote called Autobiography of Red. So this is a book about um, my, my passionate engagement with Autobiography of Red, is sometimes when you're a, a reader or a writer, you develop these very intimate relationships with the books you love. And I'm trying to make sense of that. Like, how do we develop these relationships with a bunch of words on the page? And why do these things come to mean so much to us? So those are some of the things I'm working on right now. That is so fascinating. Oh my gosh, you're working on some fascinating stuff. Well, look, I mean, we would love to have you back on later down the road uh, to talk about some of these stuff. I would love to talk about poetry. Um, I've only had the one podcast where I, where I spoke to this woman, Wendy. Um, do you know her? Have you ever heard of her? Yeah, yeah, I know her work. Yeah, poetry is a very small world. <laughs> That's what she said too. Yeah, she's, I remember her saying that too. Um, she was, I got to tell you, just one of the most amazing episodes that we had I just r so enjoyed that conversation because real quick um, she also mentioned like or we br she brought up the idea of poetry like where it began around campfires and it was a way to tell stories and pass along information and it wasn't about art in that sense and you know it was like this tool that we needed in society and I was like oh my god this is co so cool right like how poetry evolved and it could be, you could argue that like, it's like, you know, the, the beginning of how we conversed with each other 
in a way, yeah. uh, right? Like to tell these stories. And I, that's, that's fascinating to me. That's so cool. So anyway, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to, to come back and nerd out on poetry sometime. Uh, uh, yeah, I would love it. We, we definitely would love that. Again, thank you so much for your time. This was just so amazing. Thank you, Patrick. And I'm glad the, the mutts stayed quiet during, during the recording. <laughs> listening to the Lone Star Plate podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. For more info, go to lonestarplate.show.